All right, this is a lecture for my um, third hour class on the 13th of April. You will have a test tomorrow, and that test will be to go back and look for review questions as far back as the election of 1912. But the test will mainly cover from the election of Woodrow Wilson through what we cover today. So anyway, back to this. Um, you know, it, it turned into a stalemate. That means a swap, neither side was winning. Millions were dying, but nobody was making any progress. Uh, and for weeks, there would be no action. One of the major, major things that these soldiers, and by the way, this is true in all wars, one of the major things that kind of reminds you of prison. You know, when you ask people who have been incarcerated for a long time, what was the biggest thing you had to adjust to in prison? They'll say boredom, just sitting there with nothing else to do. Boredom. Well, soldiers who go to war, will often tell you, and I don't care which war you choose, they'll often tell you the same thing, because you're not fighting 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, you, Although there's one battle here that lasts 300 days, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Yeah, so, you know, you, a, a battle must be hell on earth to begin with. If it lasts a day or two or three, you're probably just completely worn out. Imagine getting up every morning for the next 300 days and fighting a battle. And that's I'm going to talk about that battle in just a moment. Anyway, it's the longest battle in World War One, maybe the longest battle in history. But anyway, uh, they would sit for weeks with nothing, and then all of a sudden the other side would open up with their artillery for several days, and then all of a sudden the artillery would stop, and you would hear whistles blowing. You're sitting here in your trench looking across no man's land. You would hear whistles blowing. You would hear people yelling over the top, if it was the British, I don't know what French is for over the top, or German is, but anyway, over the top, and they would storm out, just like you saw in that little film clip, and they were slaughtered. They didn't even reach the, the other trenches. And then they would fall back in their trenches, and a week later, the other side would do the same thing. And that's what they did for four years. And it just becomes uh, a, a bloodbath. Um, you know, the number one killer in this war is that thing right there. That's a water-cooled, it's a water-cooled uh, World War I machine gun, okay? Of course, the machine gun was a new weapon. It came out of the Industrial Revolution that you should never forget, the Industrial Revolution. They produced the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it had a two to 3,000 yard range. That could start killing you 25 football fields away. What chance do you have? What chance do you have? And at first, though, there was no fear. This was a new weapon. Nobody had ever experienced this. And the British especially, they lined up just like they did at New Orleans in 1815. Uh, they lined up shoulder to shoulder with their battle flags. They've got drummer boys, just like they fought against Napoleon in 1815 at Waterloo. And they sweep across the field. A lot of British officers... Just to show their men, you know, the officers are out in front, and just to show their men how little they were f feared the Germans, didn't carry any weapons. The only thing they took with them was a cannon, and they just walked right out there in the open in front of their troops. One British, we're going to talk about the Battle of the Somme, that's the bloodiest day in British history. And one British two regiment, as it was sweeping across the field, just before the Germans opened up with them on machine guns, you know, the national sport of England, they call it football, we call it soccer. They kicked, they would say a football, they kicked the soccer ball and cheered between the ranks as they're going to their death because it's almost like nothing bad is going to happen to us. And then all of a sudden the machine guns open up uh, and they're massacred. They're mowed down like uh, wheat being cut by a, uh, a combine. They had bagpipers playing bagpipes. You know, it, was, it, was all, it, was 18, it was 1915, but it was 1815 all over again. War had not changed in a hundred years. That's something else World War I did. World War II is going to be, there aren't going to be any trenches in World War II. World War II is going to be fought very, there are going to be these massive charges against the enemy on either side. Both sides, the generals on both sides learned their lesson, but it took a massacre of millions uh, to do that. So both sides were completely unprepared for the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, gas, you mentioned gas the other day, the first time gas must be, there's two types. There's chlorine gas that cooks your lungs. You're young, your lungs are healthy. Uh, they could give you a good whip of chlorine gas and it would look like somebody had taken, not much, just someone had taken your lungs and thrown them on a hot barbecue grill for an hour. Uh, the other one, it chokes you to death. That's mustard gas, okay? Uh, and it was first used at a battle in Belgium called the Battle of Ypres. 
I'm not going to talk about a lot of these battles, but uh, you know, if you ever see Ypres, it's a World War One battle. It's 1915, and uh, the Germans introduced it, you know, and they fired those gas canisters out of cannons, artillery. And there were a group of Canadian troops holding a certain segment of the British line, and the Germans were going to try to break through there, so they fire these uh, gas canisters, and they would hit and just sort of bounce like a pebble skipping across the pond. And finally, they would stop and then just start hissing. And this grayish green gas would come out of it. Well, here were those Canadians. They were looking there like, what the heck is that? But they noticed that their forward troops, when that greenish gas uh, covered or reached those forward troops, those men were grabbing their throats and falling down choking. Well, there was a Canadian officer there. And apparently, he paid attention in chemistry class because he took out his handkerchief. He knew exactly what it was. He took out his handkerchief and he peed in his handkerchief and, and he put it across his nose like that because human urine has ammonia in it and ammonia filters gas. So he lived, okay? And other men looked at him and I guess they started peeing their handkerchiefs, uh, you know, and the, uh, the ones that lived through that, I guess, did that. And of course, it isn't long after that that uh, all uh, combatants in this war are being. Uh, given gas masks, even their mules. And by the way, this is a mule. This is the last great mule and horse war of World War I is, okay? Uh, Hitler, by the way, is a soldier in World War I. He's a young soldier. He had a very dangerous job. He had to run messages between the trenches, okay? And nobody knows. I mean, Hitler's just a nobody at this point. He had to run messages between the trenches. And something was like a month left in the war before Germany, quote, surrenders. I'm not so sure it was a surrender, but Germany surrenders. Hitler's running, uh, and a, he doesn't have his gas mask on, and a gas canister's fired, and it lands near him. He's running down a trench, and it lands near him, but before he can get his gas mask out, he's overcome with the gas, and he passes out. And if two more minutes, you know, I, I, the more I study history, the more I'm amazed at the small things that influence great events. This is Hitler that started the greatest war in history 25 years later. Two more minutes would have passed by, and you'd have never heard of Hitler. He wouldn't even have been a footnote of history. But another runner came along, and he had his gas mask on, and he saw Hitler fighting for breath, and he grabbed him and put his mask on him and then dragged him away. And Hitler ends World War I sitting in a German hospital. And for the rest of his life, he had a lung affliction. He coughed. You, I'm gonna share, well, I guess if you take American history too, I'm gonna show you some uh, pictures of Hitler. How many of you ever heard Hitler speak? I think so. You think so? Well, if you'd heard him, you'd know so. I think so. Well, that's a, that's a shame. You all ought to, but anyway, I've got several film clips of Hitler speaking. He was a phenomenal speaker, but he coughs. He'll cough, you know, because he had that lung ailment from the trenches of World War I for the rest of his life. He was a victim of gassing as well. By the way, gassing could, uh, gassing could uh, uh, blind you, blind you as well. This is a John Singer Sargent painting. I've seen it. It's in the, um, I think it's in the uh, Imperial War Museum in London. But that's a group of gas victims, young men, and they've got their eyes bound up and there are people laying on the side, and they're all, and here's a man that still has his sight, and he's, you know, the way you're gonna get back to the aid station so they can take a look at you is you put your uh, arm on the shoulder of the man in front of you, and then this fellow here is sort of leading you all along. But the, the name of this painting is Gas, okay? Those were British troops from World War I. So gas, gas was deadly uh, in more than one way. Write this down, the first tanks ever used in war were used in World War One. Why is a tank called oh, there's airplanes? I'm gonna let me let me let, let, let just let's go to the airplane. We'll do it. Well since airplanes are next on this, we'll do airplanes. The um, the airplane, okay, this is the first air war. Now there have been planes, you know the Wright brothers flew in nineteen oh three. But eleven years later when World War One breaks out, this is the first airplane war. Okay. And these pilots that flew these airplanes, they were the most romantic figures of the war. They kind of viewed them, well, we're, we're about to take another moonshot, and this time it's going to be female astronauts, and they're going to go to the moon. And I think that's great. And I assure you the whole world will be watching. Well, the whole world was watching these guys. Planes, had never, planes were brand new, and they certainly had never been used in warfare. 
Uh, and these guys are viewed as great heroes. Uh, they wore leather caps, and their wives or girlfriends would uh, knit them these long scarves that they would wear that would flutter in the wind when they took off. Uh, and they got up above the trenches and they fought in, uh, write this down, in dogfights. They were biplanes. There's one right there. That's a British plane. You can tell by that marking right. It's red, white, and blue in color. British plane. You see he's got his machine gun up. Uh, and there's a Red Baron pizza. Have any of you eaten any Red Baron pizza? Is it any good? Not really. Well, this is a publicity stunt. Uh, there's a guy flying, and that's not a that's a not a, an original plane, but it's a model of a World War One plane, and he's got Red Baron on. That. If you look at if you go to the grocery store, you get this Red Baron guy. He's got the leather cap on and scarf. He's a World War One pilot. There really was a Red Baron, and I'll talk about him in just a moment. He was a German pilot, and he was the most famous pilot of the war. He shot down. 80 planes. He shot down 80 Allied planes. His name was Manfred von Richthofen, but I'll talk about him later. I'll show you his picture. But anyway, these guys fought dogfights. And I mean, not much higher than the lights on the football field. A little bit, but not much higher than the lights on the football field. And, uh, you know, it was sort of a gentlemanly thing. A German pilot, who a British pilot on the other side, would send a note over. I'm going to be up over no man's land tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I challenge you to a duel. And they would get there, it's an open cockpit, and they would get there and they would fly around with pistols shooting at each other. And the soldiers would come out of the trenches and sit on the edge of the trenches. And when it looked like the British pilot was winning, the British troops would cheer. And when the German was winning, the German troops uh, would cheer. <coughs> they carried their bombs in a basket in their lap, and they would fly around and they would just look in the trenches. And when they saw something that they thought was worth bombing, they would drop it by hand. Of course, the soldiers down in the trenches got a little irritated by that. And so they would sit there, and those guys weren't flying that high, and a lot of times they would just shoot them. That's what happened to Rick Tofen, the most famous pilot, with just a few days left in the war. He shot to death by an Australian uh, down in a trench, okay? So anyway, uh, you know, they dropped their bombs by hand. Um, there were some problems. Anything that's new comes with problems. At first, they put these machine guns on these planes, and of course, they're prop jobs. There's a propeller in front of it, okay? And they didn't synchronize the propeller. You have to synchronize it so when you level your machine gun and you're coming down on an enemy plane and you start firing, your bullets have to go between the propeller blades, okay? And they didn't do that. A lot of these pilots would be kept zeroing in on a guy and they would shoot their own propeller off and crash to the ground. So, you know, they had to go back to the drawing board. But like I say, like anything new, it uh, it's, uh, uh, comes with problems. Uh, if you shot down 21 enemy planes, get this down, if you shot down 21, you were an ace, okay? And the most famous ace that America had was not him. Uh, there he is right there. See his machine gun, prop job here? That's Eddie Rickenbacker. Write him down. That's the most famous American pilot of World War I, Eddie Rickenbacker. I don't know how many planes he shot down. He shot down 21 at least. <clears throat> But the most famous pilot of World War I was this German, Baron von Richthofen. He was called the Red Baron. A lot of people think that that Red Baron pizza, some ad agency just thought that up on Fifth Avenue in New York. No, it's named after a real character. He painted his plane red. He wanted everybody there to know it was him. Every time he got in that plane and flew up, it was a, it was a challenge. Uh, and he shot down 80 planes. And in April of 1918, just a few months, I said weeks a while ago, but just a few months before the war was over, and this is April of 1918, the war ends in November of 1918, uh, he was going after number 81. He saw a Flint French pilot flying up the Somme River. The Somme River is in southern Belgium. He takes out after him, and like I say, there's an Australian soldier down in the trench, and he sees that red plane, and he just raised his rifle and uh, shot him, shot him, uh, and the bullet went right through his chest, and that was the end of Baron von Richthofen. He was only 25, 25 years old. Um, so that's the most famous pilot of the war, okay, Richthofen. There's Eddie Rickenbacker, okay. Uh, the tank, get this down. You know, for four years they tried to break through the barbed wire and no man's land and never did. Right at the end of the war, 
they enjoyed a few, the British did, they enjoyed a few small breakthroughs because, you know, war always improves technology, and that's a World War I thing. And, you know, unless it got stuck in the mud and the infantry could run up and force their way in and kill the crew, or it took a direct hit from a big gun, you couldn't stop the things. They're very, 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 very slow. It would take, it would, I don't know, it would take forever for them to go from here to the football field house. Very, very slow. But uh, that's, uh, that's the first tank, and it was invented by the British. And by the way, the reason it's called, and the reason if you ever wonder why is a tank called a tank, there's a modern day tank. That's a war machine. The reason that a tank is called a tank is because the British were building those down in London, but they knew that there were German spies all over England, and of course they didn't want the Germans to find out about the latest technology the British were developing. So when they would finish a tank, you know, they, they, they're not just going to send it straight to the, across the English Channel to France to the Western Front to fight. They're going to make a couple of test runs with it. So they would take it all the way from London, which is in the very south of England, all the way to Scotland, which is in the very north of England. But the problem was you had to get, and they would take it to the Scottish Highlands, which is, if you haven't been there, you need to go one of those beautiful places in the world. But if you think you've ever been isolated, just wait till you get to the Scottish Highlands. You will think it's beautiful, but you'll think, you know, I've come to the end. There's nobody here. Except they have these gigantic rabbits. So they have rabbits that big. Uh, first time I, and they're everywhere. First time I went walking through the Highlands, I thought I was in a science fiction movie. These gigantic rabbits were everywhere. But anyway, when you're up there, you're there with the rabbits. And once you got to Scotland, you could test them, and the spies wouldn't know about it. But you had to get them out of London. I've already told you this was the last mule and horse war, right? They were also constantly having to build these huge, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of horses. They're having to build these huge water tanks and ship them over to France. So this is the way they did it. They said, we'll just put these tanks in big crates and we'll just stamp water tank on and put it on a train and as it pulls out the station the German spies will think oh those are just water tanks. Well that's how the tank that's how the tank uh, became a uh, tank, okay? So I hope by now you can identify World War I by its weaponry. If you ever hear of a war in which there was massive trench warfare, machine guns, mustard gas, over the top, flying aces, no man's land, barbed wire, all of those things ought to take your mind directly to the First World War. Of course, with all of these weapons and others that I haven't mentioned, but with all of these weapons, the ferocity of this war took the whole world by surprise. The world had never seen a war like this. Just think about this. In a battle, write this battle down. Um, Argonne Forest. Argonne Forest. At the Battle of Argonne Forest, there was more. There was more ammunition. Let's think about this. More ammunition fired in the first three hours of that battle than in the entire American Civil War. More ammunition in three hours than in the entire American Civil War. The world had never seen a war like that. I want to talk to you today, right now, in fact, about two of the worst battles. Get this down. We're going to talk, and they happened at the same time in 1916, in the summer of 1916. Uh, one is the Battle of the Somme, and the other is the Battle of Verdun. The Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Verdun. Okay, and I want you to know. These are the only two battles I'm going to talk about. I want you to know who fought in these, in these battles. And I don't think I have to tell you the outcome because none of these battles are successful. It's just a bloodbath, okay? Anyway, so uh, the Psalm. The Psalm was in uh, the Psalm. I need to put a map there. The Somme River is right, I think. Well, I want you. I think you can see it. The Somme, you see the tip of that red line right there? 
That's where the psalm is. It's in southern Belgium. Write that down. It's always good to know where. If you don't know where something happens, you're just writing about some events spinning through the universe. Could have happened in Chicago for all you know. It didn't. It happened in southern Belgium. And write this down. At this battle, and this is not entirely true, but for our purposes, it's close enough. It was between the Germans and the British. The Germans and the British. And here's what... And the plan, the British were going to finally achieve a breakthrough. The British were going to break through the German lines here and march all the way to Berlin and capture it. All the way to Berlin. In fact, the British had set aside 11 divisions. There are 250,000 men, 250,000 men in a uh, in 11 divisions, okay? And so here was the British plan. We'll just go to my simple map right here. Here were the German lines. Here's Berlin. This is the eventual objective. Here are the British lines, okay? And the British picked out, uh, let me get this right. I think it was a 12 mile long. Well, I don't, I don't see it here. Anyway, the British picked out a section of the German lines and they started bombarding it, okay? Write that down. They opened up with a bombardment. That didn't surprise, that didn't surprise anyone. Their plan was to blow a hole in the middle of the German lines and march through. And for six days, 24 hours a day, hello? I know. Anyway, for six days, <clears throat> the British bombarded, I'm going to say, about a 10-mile wide section of the German lines with everything they had. Everything that they had. 24 hours a day, they didn't stop. And on Saturday morning at about 7 o'clock on July the 1st, 1916, after six days, 24 hours a day of bombing, after six days, the bombing all of a sudden stopped. And of course, the British were very certain that there was nothing in front of them. They said a grasshopper could not live through that bombardment. They were literally going to blow a hole through the German trenches and then send 220,000 men through those trenches and capture Berlin. But here's what they didn't know. They had collapsed the trenches all right. And you've seen those trenches, right? Seen, yeah, the movie. They had collapsed. But guess what? The trenches, the timbers, and the dirt, you know, the machine gunners were sitting up there when this bombardment started, and it just collapsed on top of them. And it killed a few of them, but most of them were covered with mud and timber from the trench. And they were just down there hugging their machine guns, and the British pounded them for the next six days, and those guys are down there almost... You see what I'm talking about? Almost perfectly protected. They didn't kill them. And then all of a sudden, you with me? All of a sudden, the shooting stops, and those Germans, who must have been stunned, they must have never heard right for the rest of their lives, but those Germans come crawling out, and they set their machine guns up, because they can hear those whistles blowing over there, and they know what's about to happen. And the British are just ecstatic. They're laughing and joking. I mean, the war's over. We're going to march to Berlin. We can go across. You know, we know what this is. This is Pickett's Charge. Remember that? Third day of the battle. This is Pickett's Charge. What was what were the Confederates going to do? They're going to blow a hole in the Union line and send 15,000 men through. Well, this is Pickett's Charge on a grander scale. And they're going to just sweep across that field and uh, they're going to win the war. Well, about 100 yards into the attack, they marched 100 yards laughing and joking and calling out names to each other or calling out each other's names and about 100 yards into the attack the German machine gun had opened up. And to say it's a slaughter was an understatement. Just think about this. There were 85 British soldiers hit by, by German machine gun fire every one second. 85 British, every second, 85 British soldiers going there. 
And on the first, now this is the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, and the British Army is a thousand years old. On the first day, 22,000 British soldiers were killed and 40,000 were wounded. And they were thrown back in the trenches. And what did the British do the next day? Tried again. They charged again. They charged again. And they charged again off and on, not every day, but they charged again from July through November. From July through November. 420,000 British soldiers were killed and wounded. 420,000 British soldiers were killed and wounded. And if you throw in the French and the Germans, all told, there were at this one battle, 1.3 million people killed and wounded. Killed and wounded at the Battle of the Somme. And how, how far did the line, the, the British never achieved the breakthrough, but how far? After losing 420,000 men, how far did the lines move? None. Two miles. Maybe the distance of you fall if you drive through it. After losing 420,000 men. And that's why, as I said to you the other day, Belgian and French farmers still, they're putting their tools. I've seen them plow in Belgium. Little, they're Belgian-made tractors. I can't they're little blue tractors, little blue. They really consider them small, but this fits their purposes perfectly. A Leyland tractor. I don't know well, I remember that. But anyway, when they put their tractors in their disc up, they see bone chips. They see part of the spinal column. Yeah, you know. Still to this day, 109 years later. Okay. Finally, one more. At the same time this battle was going on, look, at the same time the British are trying to break through here, the Germans launch an attack directly toward Paris here, okay? Right here. See that? The German army comes through, tries to come through. And there was a French army there to stop them, and the center of the French line was an old medieval fortress. I haven't been to this place, and I want to go. It's one of my retirement things, maybe. I don't know. Anyway. But there was an old castle from the Middle Ages, a thousand years old, or 800 years, or 600 years old, called Verdun. There are a million people buried there. Think about that. A million people buried there. You ever been to Arlington National Cemetery in Washington? Well, you know, how many people, but you remember how many people, you, it just looks like people, there are 400,000 people buried there. At this cemetery, there are 600,000 more, just to show you the size. Arlington National Cemetery is gigantic. Uh, but this one's got 600,000 more people buried there, yeah, German and French. Of course, this, is a, this was in Verdun. Verdun here was 163 miles east of Paris. And if the Germans broke through there, see, while the Battle of the Somme is going on here, if the Germans break through there, they will march to Paris and win the war. Everybody knew that Verdun, the French knew that Verdun had to hold. In fact, the, um, get this down, the French commander was a man named Philippe Pétain. Well, later become infamous in World War II for collaborating with the Nazis, but Philippe Pétain, and he was in command, and the president of France, <coughs> excuse me, came down before the battle started, he talked to Phaeton. And he you know, told him that they discussed the gravity of the situation. If the Germans break through here, they win the war. And Phaeton said to the president of France, he said, they shall not pass. Write that down. I ask you which battle is associated with the words, they shall not pass, because I haven't been there, but they say over the entrance to the cemetery are those words, they shall not pass. And the battle began and this is the longest battle of World War I. It may be the longest battle in history. Do you know of any battle longer than 300 days? And I mean, they fought every day. Do you know of any battles with 300? I don't. Uh, it was horrible. I mean, that almost goes, <laughs> pardon me, that almost goes without saying. The Germans attacked for 300 days and 300 nights. <clears throat> Just think about this. The Germans 
their pre-attack bombardment of the French lines landed 100,000 shells per hour for 12 hours on a six-mile section of the French lines. In other words, they just picked out six miles. This is where we're going to go through. And they landed 100,000 shells in a six-mile area every hour, every hour for 12 hours. And then the Germans went forward. And all... 40 million shells, think of that, 40 million shells were fired. I'm talking about big guns, artillery, not little rifle shot, but 40 million shells were fired at Verdun. Verdun. And here's a new weapon, by the way, it's not new anymore, but here's a, we use this a lot in World War II. And the Germans introduced a new weapon called the flamethrower, okay, and it's liquid fire. Uh, and men were burned alive, okay, all over that battlefield. There were men still standing in their positions in their trenches, cooked, okay, blackened, blackened corpses. Uh, men survived in shell holes. The trenches were uh, obliterated, and you ran to the nearest shell hole. There would be 50 men, and some of those men stayed in the same shell hole for months at a time. Uh, they ran out of water. The only way they survived is that they drank their own urine. And eventually, they, had, they were so dehydrated, there was no urine. People literally went mad uh, for uh, uh, a, drink, a drink of water and would jump out of the shell hole and go running to, in the direction they thought they might find water, and they were immediately mowed down. A million more casualties right here. I've talked to you about two battles, and you have almost the population of Oklahoma killed and wounded in those two battles. Just two of the battles in World War II. A million casualties and no breakthrough. The lines didn't move. The lines didn't move. And then one other one, and I'm not going to talk about it, I'm just going to put the name up here, the Battle of Passchendaele. That's in Belgium, Passchendaele. 290,000 more, well, 300,000 more British troops killed at one battle. 300,000 troops killed in one battle. And they didn't break through. And I'm going to show you a little film here. Just about How much time do I have left today? If I've got time to show you what I want to. Yeah, it's 10.30. Yeah, yeah. I think I've got time. Well, look, let me just tell you the story. At Passchendaele, I don't think this is someplace else I'm going to go see this, but. Hello? Well, second time today. At Passchendaele, they built the Great War Memorial it's called the Menon Gate. Okay? And you don't have to note that unless you want it for your own information. I'll show you a picture of the, of the men in the gate. There's the men in the gate. And they have the names of thousands of people who died there. That's in Belgium. And then there's a road, a street, a road that runs right through that. And every day at 5 o'clock, and this has happened since 1919, every day at 5 o'clock, a British bugler walks there, stops traffic, and he plays the British equivalent to our taps. You, if you heard taps, if you heard taps, played at military funerals, well, I'll play that for you, but uh, he stands out there and they stop the traffic every day in honor of men who died at Passion Day. Okay, so uh, let's see if I can quickly show that to you. If not, well, if this bell rings, I'll just do it the next time we come together. That's not it. Uh, let's just Thank you. 
Smith. Yeah, there he is. See, that's the... This is the last post. I'm Joshua Hamlin in front of the Lock Nagar Mine Freighter on July 1st, 1916. A massive ex we don't care. So, anyway, so test them off. Through the battle of the Lumber What do y'all kill that? Thank you. Uh, can you just come right there? Yeah. 